We continue our series through the Gospel of Luke. Um, We're looking at chapter 7 this day, and I invite you to share it with me. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears, and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. With God, there are no nobodies. With God, there are no nobodies. Will you say that with me? With God, there are no nobodies. No outsiders. God knows who you are. He sees who you are. He sees your address. He knows exactly what you're going through. And he can reach into your deepest point of need, as he did with the leopard, and make you clean. We continue our series, The Gospel of the Nobodies, as we look at the entire Gospel of Luke uh, between, uh, in the series of Lent um, between Ash Wednesday and Easter. If you have your sermon notes, I invite you to take them out. With God, there are no nobodies, and God lifts up the lowly. Even in God's coming and God's own self, God shows up in the least expected places. God comes to Nazareth, not Jerusalem. In the first century um, Judaism, Nazareth wouldn't even be on a map. You, you would see Jerusalem, yes. You would see a few other cities, but not Nazareth. It was a no-place town. And God comes, not in the palace of Herod, but in the back of a cave to a 12 or 13-year-old girl named Mary, a peasant girl, hanging out in a nowhere town called Nazareth. And when Jesus comes through the water of a womb into this little feeding trough, who does God bring around him but shepherds, the night shift workers, the people that made the lowest wage and the furthest out, hardest work there was in the world. That's who God comes to. And so that's how the Gospel of Luke starts. And then last week, we saw that Jesus not only reached out to those folks as he comes in the little baby, but then even those who are sick, those on the outside, those who by law were separated from the community, largely for health reasons. Jesus goes there, he sees the leper, he touches him, and in that moment, the leper is made clean and restored to community. And it's also in that moment that Jesus is made unclean. Because he's touched someone with a disease and he has to go outside, back out into the wilderness to pray and to be made new before he can be reconciled to the community. And what we find in these stories, whether it's a little place called Nazareth or Mary or the shepherds or a leper, that anybody can be somebody in Jesus' name. Anybody can be somebody in Jesus' name. Will you say that with me? Anybody can be somebody in Jesus' name. And that includes you. It includes me, includes everyone that you will ever know. So through the Gospel of Luke, if you're following along or reading with me, I hope you do. It's only 24 chapters long. You can read a chapter every day between now and Easter, and you'll be uh, right as rain. You'll go through the whole Gospel of Luke. And what we find is that Luke uses this literary device contrasting nobodies and somebodies. Almost every story that you find in the Gospel of Luke, you find this alliteration where, where he has this Um, device where you've got these nobodies and then you've got these somebodies and then something surprising happens. Many of you all have been in church a long time might know the story of the prodigal son or the prodigal boys. They're both lost in their own way actually. Uh, There's an older boy and the older boy in the Jewish tradition, the oldest, is supposed to get the family inheritance. He's supposed to run the family business and all that's supposed to be his. In this story though, the father um, gives some of the inheritance to the youngest boy, uh, which was a pretty big deal especially before the father had died. I mean, can you imagine going to your parents and saying, oh, by the way, I know you're going to die someday, so why don't you just go ahead and give it to me now? That's basically what the younger boy did. And then he goes to Vegas, I mean, or, or what Israel would you know, see as Vegas, you know, wild women and partying and gambling and all the rest. And before you know it, he's in deep weeds. He's out on the street, homeless, without any money. He had blown it all. And he thinks to himself, you know, back at dad's house, there are people that work for him that are in much better shape than I am in this back alley. So he goes home, he has a change of heart, and he realizes what he's done is wrong. And and his dad welcomes him, actually runs to him, throws his arms around him, puts the family robe, the the ring, the family ring, and and throws a huge banquet, steak dinner. Wonderful. So they, they kill the fatted calf, and they have this big banquet, but the older brother, who's supposed to be the somebody in the story, 
Well, his heart has turned cold. He doesn't want to have anything to do with his little brother anymore. And his father says, this brother of yours was dead. Now he's alive. We have to celebrate. He's with us. And what you find is that the young boy who had been a nobody becomes somebody again because of the father's love. And the older boy who had been somebody really acts like a nobody because he just can't get over himself. And you find this over and over and over again in the Gospel of Luke. One of the other stories that you may know is, the, is what we call the Good Samaritan. And in Luke 10, 30 to 37, you see this set up once again. Jesus replied, he's telling the story, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. That was a very dangerous stretch. And he fell into the hands of robbers, which people would have said, well, sure he did, because that's what happens on that road. And they stripped him, they beat him, and they went away, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road. Now, let me ask you, in that day, would a priest be a somebody or nobody? Oh, yeah, that's a big somebody in Jesus' day. So here's somebody number one, right? He's going down, but what does he do? He goes on the other side because he doesn't want to be made unclean because this guy uh, probably would have had some blood on him and he couldn't touch him and he didn't, you know, wasn't smart. He had lots to do. He was a priest. He was a big deal. So likewise, a Levite, in Jesus' days, a Levite, a somebody or nobody? Somebody, a big somebody. When he comes to the place and sees him, he passes by on the other side as well. But a Samaritan, now is a Samaritan a somebody or a nobody? A nobody. Samaritans were hated. You, you would remember that um, when uh, Israel fell, right, to Assyria, what happens is some of the Israelites went over and they were not supposed to intermarry, but some of them did. The offspring of an Israeli and an Assyrian was a Samaritan. And they were unclean to every Jew. You weren't to have anything to do with them. This was the most nobody of the nobodies. And the Samaritan, while traveling, comes near, and when he sees him, he's moved with pity. He goes to him, he bandages his wounds, he pours oil and wine on them, and then he put him on his own animal, and he brought him to the inn, and he takes care of him. The next day, he takes out two denarii, that's two full days' wages. He gives them to the innkeeper and says, take care of him. When I come back, I'll repay you whatever more you spend. And then he asked this question to the man who was questioning him. Which of these three, the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan, was a neighbor to the man? who fell into the hands of the robbers. And he said, the one who showed him mercy, the Samaritan. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. You see, Luke, over and over and over again, is taking these nobodies, contrasting them with the somebodies, and then showing you that God loves all his children. And, and this is really what I want you to know this morning, friends, that God sees the person you can be, not the person you have been. God sees the person you can be. He looks at the Samaritan, he sees his heart, and he knows what kind of person he can be, and he lifts him up. It's not the person that you have been. And in truth, God sees that in the Levite and the priest too. They just don't see their own need yet because they're somebody in their own mind. They're a legend in their own mind, we might say. They're a big deal. And we always know that if you think that you're a big deal in your own mind, that you're headed for a fall. Pride goes before a fall. This happens over and over and over again. And it's a warning in Luke for those of us who, as my mama would say, are too big for our britches. It just it comes before a fall. Well, do you, do you like to read those little things? Like, you might be a redneck if. I love those things. I came across one as Chantel was helping me find some things, and, and she, she showed me this. Uh, says, you might be an Oklahoman if. You know, you might be from Oklahoma if you know that Miami, Oklahoma, is different than Miami, Florida. They're pronounced two different ways, right? You might be from Oklahoma. You might be an Oklahoman if, you know, your town has a Sonic or two or three or five or seven or McDonald's or a Little Caesars. You might be from Oklahoma if when you drive through a neighborhood, anyone out walking, they just smile and they wave at you, even if you don't know them. You might be from Oklahoma if you can pronounce Ufala, Godibo, Okima, and Chickasha. And you might be from Oklahoma if when you need to use the elevator, it includes a wheat truck. Some of you city folks don't get that. You're like, I don't know what he's saying. Everybody outside of Oklahoma City, Tulsa knows that. And finally, since it is that season, when a tornado warning siren goes out, you go out in the yard too to look for that funnel. We're all right, honey. Let the kids play. All right? You might be from Oklahoma if. Well, in Jesus' day, you might be a Pharisee if. 
See, Pharisees were a big deal. They were somebodies. And you might be a Pharisee if your focus was on the rules rather than the people. You would focus on rules over people. That's what Pharisees did. They were lawyers. There were about 6,000 of them, and they knew all the laws. They knew Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, cold, by heart. They knew all the law, and they even knew the nuances of the law of how you might live that out in your life today. Rules on the rules on the rules, if you will. You might be a Pharisee if that you are self-righteous. You think of yourself as better than. You have sort of this air of judgment about you or self-righteousness. You know, you're the kind of people who could make it to church at 9.15 even on daylight savings. I mean, good people. You know, not like those 10.45 folks would be lucky to get here before noon. I mean, good people, right? And, and the thing is, it's tricky about that, is we do want to come to church. We do want to be in community. We want to do what God wants us to do, and we want to get better. We want to be better people. That's good. But there's a slight hair's difference between being better people and being better than people. And that's the trick. Because there's just that big of a difference between getting better and thinking that you're better than. And it's a nasty trap that happens over and over and over again. When you can kind of hear yourself thinking, oh, well, you know, at least I'm not like them, or I'm better than that, or you know you're in trouble. You see, you might be a Pharisee if you think of yourself as a separated one. They did. That was their job, was to be separated, set apart, holy, sacred people. And they tried to avoid sin at every cost. That's why they couldn't touch that man that was hurt on the road. Because clearly... He had been on a hard time. Sin was all around him and all on him. And you tried to avoid sin and sinners at all cost, whatever that was. And these Pharisees, these lawyers, this sect within Judaism, they were very well known and well thought of. It was a big deal to be a Pharisee. And most people couldn't do it. It was very hard. It meant a certain kind of life. And people looked up to them. And if there was a problem that they didn't know how to solve, they would go to the Pharisee to get the answer. Maybe in the same way, if you've gotten caught up in a, a legal battle or trouble that you couldn't figure out yourself, you needed to go see a lawyer. These were people that were supposed to help you, but they wielded a, a big amount of power. So Jesus tells the story about one of these guys and about a prostitute. And he sets them up side by side. One is clearly a somebody and one is clearly a nobody in Jesus' day. And so if you will, um, sometimes we, we read the scriptures and we have a hard time making sense of it. Uh, but let's imagine for a second that we were seeing the Bible as presented on stage. And in Luke 7, 28 to 35, you have the setup. The curtain is closed, and, and the person comes out in front of the curtain, and, and they say this. This is Jesus speaking to you about what's about to happen when the curtain opens. Jesus says this. Let me lay it out for you as plainly as I can. No one in history surpasses John the baptizer. John was a prophet, a big deal. But in the kingdom he prepared you for, the lowliest person is ahead of John. It's ahead of John the Baptist. The ordinary and the disreputable people who heard John by being baptized by him into the kingdom, receiving the Holy Spirit of God, being baptized in the kingdom of God, they are the clearest evidence. The Pharisees and the religious officials would have nothing to do with such a baptism, you see, because they wouldn't think of giving up their place and line to their inferiors, because they were somebody. They were better than in their mind. Now, how can I account for the people of this generation, Jesus says? They're like spoiled children complaining to their parents. Well, we wanted to skip rope, and you were always too tired. We wanted to, you know, talk, but you were always too busy. And John the baptizer came fasting, and you called him crazy. The son of man, a name that Jesus used for himself, came feasting, and you called him a lush. Opinion polls don't count for much, Jesus says, do they? The proof of the pudding is in the eating. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. And another way to say this is our actions speak louder than words. And we're about to see that actions matter. What we do matters a lot more than what we say. And the curtain opens. And here's the story that Jesus says. In Luke 7.36, the story opens like this. One of the Pharisees, one of the somebodies, asked Jesus to eat with him. That was a big deal. It meant that there was a sense of intimacy and closeness. Uh, some would believe it even made you family. And he went into the Pharisees, the lawyer's house, and he took his place at the table. Now, you'll notice here that there's a lot that happens from Jesus being outside to coming into this dinner party, and you get no detail, no detail about that at all. But in first century dining, it would have looked like this. This is a triclinium, tri meaning three, um, and then 
Um, it was basically how you ate dinner. You would lay down and you would lean on one arm and you would eat with the other. And you can see how your feet would be behind you. Uh, the servants would come either to the center and serve you there uh, or care for you from behind. That, they, that way you weren't interrupted uh, during your dinner. You were simply there. It was a very intimate setting. And all the servers kind of worked in the background behind you. And you, you had a wonderful, beautiful, intimate dinner. But there's no detail yet in the story. That's going to come later and it will be important. So here comes the problem. This lady from who knows where doing who knows what shows up at this very intimate dinner party. In Luke 7, uh, 37, it says this, And a woman in the city who was a sinner, that's really all we need to know. Other translations call her a harlot. Uh, most think that she was a prostitute. And this woman, having learned that he was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brings an alabaster jar of ointment. Now, again, this is a really big deal because an alabaster jar of ointment would have been probably her life savings. Uh, some believe it would have been uh, nard or a very expensive perfume. And there's no market. There's no New York Stock Exchange at that time. So you weren't investing in stocks and bonds and businesses in that way. You would invest in either fine linens or gold or perfume. So this was maybe all the money she had in the world. And she stands behind Jesus at his feet. You can see from the triclinium how that could happen now. And she's weeping. She's weeping and she's weeping. And she begins to bathe his feet with her tears. And then something scandalous happens, even more scandalous than showing up at a Pharisee's house. Someone who was a sinner who's not supposed to be anywhere close to a Pharisee, she lets her hair down. Now, in Jesus' day, you couldn't let your hair down. I mean, that was something that you would only do with your husband in the most intimate of settings. You would never see a woman with her hair down. And here she is at a dinner party, and she lets her hair down, and she starts drying Jesus' feet with her hair. And then she kisses him. She's kissing his feet. And to caress a man's feet in that day, and probably even in this day, I mean, that had some sexual overtones to it. They're like, what are you doing? You imagine if somebody comes in a dinner party at your house, takes off the shoes of one of your guests, and starts putting oil on their feet, and, uh, you know, as you eat dinner, you're like, awkward. I mean, that doesn't happen every day. And, and the Pharisee, whose home it was, I mean, she was blowing up the party. This was a mess. You see, the alabaster jar of perfume, it shows her plan to anoint Jesus. This wasn't something that she stumbled upon. There's a backstory there somewhere. Jesus means a great deal to her. They already have a relationship in some way. We don't know what that is. All we know is that she understands that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Savior. He is the one that has forgiven her sins. And she could not be more grateful that her past life is now past. She's forgiven. She's made new. She's free. And she's saying thank you with all that she has to Jesus. It's a sign of her love. But now, she has created a scene. She's made Jesus unclean in the Pharisee's mind because she was unclean. And if you touch something that's unclean, now you're unclean. And she scandalized the Pharisee. Came into his home at his dinner party. Someone that he's not supposed to associate with. Everything that she touches is now unclean. It's going to take weeks to clean this up. But see, here's the problem with folks who think too highly of themselves, particularly if we're smart. And that is that we can make some assumptions, and most of the time, I mean 90% of the time, we're right about our assumptions. The problem is the inferences we make from those assumptions can be dead wrong. And they were for this guy. So the story continues like this in verse 39. When the Pharisee who had invited him, Jesus, saw it, he said to himself, Wait a minute. If Jesus were a prophet, he would have known what kind of woman this is who's touching him. That she is a sinner. And Jesus, seeing his heart, knowing what he's thinking, he speaks up and he says to him, Simon, hold, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. I have something to say to you. And Simon, you know, just disgusted. He's like, well, teacher, then, you know, bring it. Speak, because this is not okay in my house. It's not the way this is supposed to be going down. See, the assumptions that the lawyer makes is this, that the woman is a sinner. Is he right? Yes. Everybody in town knew that this woman was a sinner. That, that's, that's true. The second assumption he makes is that Jesus, as a prophet, knew this. Did Jesus know that? Of course he did. So, so he knows the basic facts. But friends, knowing just the facts, knowing just the information is not enough. It's about our attitudes and our hearts. And that's what God has always looked at through the Bible. He looks at our hearts. And are they hearts of judgment or hearts of love? The law only leads to sin and death. 
It takes more than that. So the lawyer wrongly infers that Jesus would not let her touch him because she was a sinner. And he gets that wrong. Jesus is like, sure. She's been forgiven much. This is a beautiful thing that she's doing for me. And then the lawyer infers even more that since Jesus did not stop her, therefore he must not be a prophet. Because any good prophet would never let a sinner touch them. Which again, not knowing the heart of God, he gets wrong. And in church life, this can happen over and over and over again. We can know the right thing to do. We can know the law. We can know the things we're supposed to do. But we can still miss it if our hearts are far from God. When it's more about us and our reputation and what's going on in and around our home than it is about pleasing God. So Jesus says to Simon the Pharisee, he says, Simon, hold on a minute. Let me tell you a story. So in verse 41 to 43, he says this story to Simon. He says, you're a lawyer, you'll get this. He says, here's the riddle. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii. Now remember that a, a denarius or a denarii is one day's wage. Okay, looks like this. Uh, it's a tiny little silver coin. Uh, we actually have these. You can see, I mean, I don't have them. The world has them. You can see them. Um, and it's, you know, about the size of a dime. Okay? This would have represented a complete day's wage. All right? So one guy owes him 500, about two years of his wages. Around here, that might be as much as $200,000. That's a big debt. The other guy, 50, two months' wages. And then when they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. And Jesus asked the Pharisee, now which of them will love him more? Well, Simon answered, well, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Now, at this point, the trap has been set and the trap is now sprung. Because Jesus already has him as a lawyer where he wants him. He's already answered the question. And he's answered it rightly. But we're about to see why that's bad news for Simon. So Jesus turns to the woman. And he says to Simon, Simon. Do you see her? Do you see this woman? Look at her. This is a child of God. She's important to me. She's somebody to me. Look at her. Has she been forgiven little or much? Much. It's right that she would give all that she has, that she would weep and be thankful because she's been forgiven much. Look at her, Simon. You hard-hearted so-and-so. And then he goes on and shows him how she is actually much better than he. He says, now, as you look at her, think of this. He says, when I entered your house, Simon, you gave me no water for my feet. Now, by law, does Simon have to give him water for his feet? No. No more than you have to take someone's coat when they come to your house. But that was the cultural thing to do. It would have been the gracious thing to do would have to given him water for his feet. But he didn't do that because Simon didn't really care about Jesus in that way. He just wanted him in his house so he could show his friends that he had Jesus at his house. He says, you didn't give me any water for my feet, but she has. She bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. He says, when I came in your house, Simon, you didn't even give me a kiss. Now again, by law, you don't have to, but you know, if we were friends, you would have. But you didn't do that. Now this lady over here, on the other hand, from the time I came in, she's not stopped kissing my feet. Then he says this, you didn't even anoint my head with oil. Do you have to by law? No, but if we were friends, you would have. If you cared for me at all, that's exactly what you would do if you showed somebody honor and grace and hospitality in your home. But this woman, she's anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven since she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven, meaning you, Simon, loves little. And clearly that's you. You love little. And that's tragic. It's heartbreaking. And then look what Jesus says to her. Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Now, friends, this is such an important story. Because Jesus, the point of this story is to connect the Pharisee's answer and all the previous actions of the night to the woman's act of love and gratitude. Simon, you didn't do this. She did. Simon, you didn't do that. She did. Simon, you didn't do this. She did. Now, who's somebody in God's kingdom? Who really is the somebody? Who has the right heart? Who's doing the right thing? Well, the woman is. Not you. And, and that's what it is, friends. It's, 
It's so hard sometimes to see, isn't it? When we get all self-righteous, when we think we know the answer, when we know the law, when we know the right thing to do, and others aren't doing it the way they're supposed to, our hearts just shrink. They get very small, tiny. And we miss the whole kingdom of God. The important things of life that really are life, like mercy and forgiveness and grace and joy. Having a heart like Simon's will suck the joy right out of your life. It'll turn a beautiful dinner party to something ugly. It did at Simon's house. But you see how offended he would be? He has this beautiful dinner set up, and this woman, who's not supposed to be anywhere near him, comes to his table, blows up his dinner party. He had plans. He had an agenda. He had an idea. It was supposed to go like this. And she messed it up. Not only does she mess it up, then she takes down her hair. You can't do that. And then she kisses his feet. You're not supposed to do that. It was very uncomfortable. And he was mad as a hornet about it. What he didn't see was that his actions were way worse than hers. But he couldn't see it. He couldn't see it. Now, in just a moment, I'll give you the, the Disney ending where I, I tell you a nice story about a prostitute. And I'll do that. And I hope you feel good about it. But I also need to tell you this. When we come to these stories... In this story in particular, there's only three characters we get to choose from. There's Jesus, and then we get to choose which of the three we are. Guess what? None of us are Jesus. We don't get to be Jesus in this story. The second person we can choose from uh, might be the prostitute. And for some of you here, you may be beaten down and broken and forgiven much, and you realize that, and you're ready to give everything you have for Jesus and his call. And if that's you, that's beautiful, and I celebrate that with you. But my hunch is that's probably a pretty small percentage at the 915 Daylight Savings Time crew. More often than not, when we look at the story, we have to admit, oh, no, I'm Simon. I have dinner parties and I have my agenda. It's supposed to go the way I want. And if you cross me, you're out. Now I'll smile and I'll wave and I'll be nice to you, but you're on my bad list. And you don't get invited next time. We all have these moments of self-righteousness and judgment because we've been around long enough to know the way these things are supposed to go. And friends, it's just a really dangerous place to be. Unless we see something of ourselves in the character of Simon the Pharisee, we are blind to our own desperate need for forgiveness, to hear the story anew that we, like Simon, need to throw ourselves down at Jesus' feet and say, save me too. I need saving too. It's not just her. Save me from myself, from the things I've learned, from the degrees I've earned, from the work I've done. Save me, Lord, because none of that will get me to you because you look at my heart. You see, Simon's problem was not so much His conduct, he didn't break the law. It was his attitude. And all of us know this. We've all been in family systems from time to time where someone does the right thing, but you know if someone wasn't watching, they wouldn't have. You can make yourself do it. It's the gratitude of being forgiven and understanding that forgiveness that's a source of new life for all the world. For all the world. And then they they figured it out, the people at the table did. They said, well, well, hold on a minute. Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Only God can do that. Only God can do that. And and so they start talking amongst themselves. They said, who is this who can even forgive sins? I would remind you that before Jesus came, no one could forgive sins but God alone. And so that happened only at the temple. So for Jesus to say, your sins are forgiven, that just blew their mind. And because the Holy Spirit today... Because Jesus lives with us, we can forgive one another. We can forgive in Jesus' name, something that no one before Jesus could do. Not in the same way. And he says to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Go in peace. It's a beautiful thing. And this happens even today. As we were studying for this weekend's message, I came across a story about a woman named Mary Nelson. It's a wonderful story. There's a great ministry in Hawaii that took her in and gave her a job as a dishwasher. Despite her lovely personality and her quick humor, she was too intimidated to interact with the customers. So the first six months of the job, all she did was hide in the back and wash dishes. What's remarkable about this is that it was only the second job this lady had had in her life. And she was 
53. And before starting at Seed, that's the name of the restaurant, it's a justice restaurant that provides employment for the community's at-risk population. Mary, her real name, had been a prostitute for 38 years. Let's take a look. I was 42nd Street, New York City. I mean, if you can imagine back in the 70s, uh, a lot of crazy stuff, rapes and robberies and kidnappings and stabbings, and I went through it all. I used to travel all over, going from state to state to figure things out. And I wound up here when I was 18 and I stayed. I worked there for over 30 years. It was awful. If I could explain it in a couple words, I was a living corpse. I've had all the jewels and all the cars and all the glamour, so they say. I was broken inside and I didn't know what to do. I was stuck. I didn't believe that people cared enough to uh, let me in or trust or and one day, I woke up just bawling and crying, and I went to a health center and asked for help. And then there were these church people, they were called church angels, the red, red light angels, and they would come out there in the streets and go tend to the girls and try to help them in whatever way they could or whatever way they let them. And there was this little tiny Japanese lady that always would come near me, and she, I'm like, oh gosh, here goes the church people, and I'd kind of run. <laughs> Uh, but I also whispered in her ear, you know, don't give up on me. And so it took almost a year more after, and then we started talking to each other. I actually invited her to my home, which I don't do to anybody, and I went to church. And that's when I wound up here. And at first, I was, they'll tell you, I stayed in the kitchen washing dishes because I didn't want to deal with any because I didn't know how to. I had social issues, believe that. And you're like, you know, you have all this energy that's good to go out there, you know, and, and now, now I'm out here and I can't get rid of me. I'm working double shifts. <laughs> I love my job. <laughs> I invited some of the girls to come and have my birthday dinner here. And, you know, of course, they were a little reluctant because they didn't uh, church people like I did. And they came. So that's the first step. They enjoyed it. They've been here a few times since then. So it's a start. They could see there is another life. After all that, there's, there are good people out there. Well, what I would like to do is help these young girls that are in prostitution or sex trafficking, uh, give them hope, give them chance. And if they see grandma can do it, then they can do it. How cool is that? She's helping ladies now, her life now, and the mission of the Lord. But what struck me in her story is she said, I was a living corpse. I was a living corpse. And as I thought about that, I thought, you know what? You don't have to be Mary to live a life of a living corpse. It's not unique to her. That can be true for all of us. We all need a Savior. We all need to be forgiven. We all need to receive new life. And I pray that that will be you, me, us today. That we would receive new life in Jesus' name. You know why? Because anybody can be somebody in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen.